And thanks everyone for joining us today. It's lovely to have you here. So let me just start with a very brief overview of my teaching context. As, to, as Paul said, I work as a teacher at British Council in Sri Lanka, and we've got lots and lots of secondary students. Um, our secondary start as young as 11 years, and they're in there until they just turn 18. So in that, in that quite wide age group, we've got three groups of secondaries. Um, I've taught all three groups over the years, but everything I'm gonna show you today, the, the project work and the examples that I show you today have mostly been done by the 11 to 14 year old group and the 16 to 18 year old group. We've also been teaching online for coming up to, I think about two years now. So everything you see um, today has all been done online. Just give me a moment while I share my screen, please. There you go. So as you can see, um, my webinar today is rather unimaginatively called Project Work in the Secondary Classroom. But I do hope that as we go through the content, uh, that by the end of it, you'll find that you're even just a little bit more inspired than the title. So I'm going to start today by telling you about a challenge that I faced teaching um, these secondary teenage students and the solution I found. We'll talk about what I mean when I, I say project or project work in the webinar. And then I'll use an example project I did as a sort of a case study where I'll take you through it stage by stage, and then we can come up with a framework that hopefully you can use in your own lessons. I'll show you some examples of final tasks that your students can do at the end of a project. We'll talk a little bit about assessment and hopefully we'll have a few minutes just to think about what we learned and, and how to apply it. So my whole experience uh, with this project-based teaching approach, it started with this challenge I had with my teenage students. I, I don't know, maybe some of you may have faced the same challenge. One of my biggest issues was how to interest my students and keep them engaged. It seemed to be a little hit and miss. So with some topics, it was fine. The lessons were amazing. But with other topics, students were just not interested in the topic. And I found that I was, I was losing their interest. H have you had the same experience? Perhaps you can just uh, make a comment in the chat. So I had this issue and I was mulling, around, um, mulling it over in my mind um, as I was talking to colleagues. I attended a few training sessions at work. I remember I did a couple of um, online courses. And because this was on my mind, I was, I was listening out for anything that would help. Because the, the fact is that we can't always teach what teenagers really want to learn. Our, our topics don't always in themselves engage teenagers. So I wondered, is there anything that I could do as a teacher to still keep them engaged, to still hold their attention, even if the topic we were discussing was, was not in itself that interesting? So in my conversations and the training I did, I realized that there were two ideas, two concepts that kept coming up. One was the idea of project work, and the other was the idea of collaboration. So just think about those two ideas for a moment now. What does collaboration mean to you? And can you give me an example of project work? Now, the little icon at the bottom there, the orange and blue um, little speech bubble, that means I'd like to hear your thoughts in the chat, please. But I do realize that some people may not really like to uh, type in the chat. You might just prefer to think about it for yourself. That, that's fine as well. So let's have a look in the chat. Yes, I've got some ideas for collaboration. Um, Gloria says working together with the purpose. That idea is repeated quite a few times. Lovely. So I think we're all on the page, uh, same page here. For, for in our context when teaching, collaboration means that our secondary students are working in teams, working together with one common goal. Let me just have a little look at project work. Are there any ideas of projects? Thank you, Alexander. You've mentioned a survey that you did. Gloria, thanks again. You, you've mentioned a presentation. 
creating something to solve a problem. Lovely, lots of great ideas for projects. Now let's just clarify um, what kind of projects I'm talking about in this webinar here. So if you keep in mind the issue of engaging and motivating students, have a look at the, the different types of projects on the screen. So we've got option A and two example projects, option B and another two examples. Now looking at the two options, which type of project do you think will be more engaging for secondary students? Option A or option B? Paul, if you wouldn't mind um, just launching the poll now. So in a few minutes, you should see a Zoom poll come up on your screen. I can see it now. Um, I can see some of you have put your answers in the chat, but could you also just click on the, the same answer, A or B, in the poll? And Paul, when you feel you've got enough responses, feel free to end and share the results. Okay, I'll give it another 10 seconds. Sure. So in the chat, it seems like we've got lots of A's. I'm interested to see what the poll results say. Yeah, there we go. So we've got 59% say option A and 41 say option B. Thanks for that poll. Now, before I tell you what I think, uh, let's just analyze the two options, the different projects. I'll give you a minute to have a look at the comparison there. So as you can see at the end, both types of projects can be collaborative, but just on the whole, option A, it just looks uh, a lot stronger. It comes out a lot stronger based on this criteria, doesn't it? Now, if we just analyze it a little deeper, you'll see that uh, option A has a specific audience in, in the project task there. And having that audience means that students have to do some research. So in the first example, they first need to do research on what a COVID-friendly holiday would entail. And then they also need to find out what kind of holiday Sri Lankan teenagers would like. Same with the second example here. First, they need to research what's a film trailer. How do you go about creating one? And then they need to think about the audience. What kind of genre would Sri Lankan teenagers be interested in? So, so all that complexity in the task, naturally it means that it would take a longer time to complete. And their core skills, so things like critical thinking, problem solving, they would develop these to a far greater extent. Now, if you look at uh, option B and these projects, overall, it just looks a whole lot simpler. And this is why when I've been reading about project-based learning, these projects in option A, they're often referred to as being a, a main course type project using the analogy of a meal. So they're main course projects because they're meaty, they're fulfilling, they're satisfying. And in contrast, the option B type projects, they've been referred to as dessert projects. They're smaller, may, may be fun, nice uh, and enjoyable, perhaps at the end of the course or at the end of a term, but they can't really fulfill students and really engage them over the whole course or over a whole term. So yes, the answer is option A. These projects, the meaty main course projects, they're the ones that will really engage students. And so that's what we're going to discuss today. Now, if I just pause there, just to recap what um, we've been talking about so far, my, my problem, my challenge was teenagers, secondary students that were not engaged. And the answer I came up with was complex projects done in a collaborative way it always equaled motivated, engaged, and interested learners. And in my experience, this holds true no matter what the topic is, even if it's a boring topic. So this then begs the question, how do you go about setting up this kind of complex collaborative project? What, what kind of framework or, or stages can you go through? 
So I think the easiest would be if I show you an example. I'll take you through the different stages that I did with my students. And then together we can come up with a framework. So as you see on the, on the slide, um, my example project was done with a group of 16 to 17 year old pre-intermediate students. And the topic was holidays. So in the next few minutes, as I take you through the different stages, just think about and possibly make notes, what are the different stages? And then we can compare at the end. So let's begin. My topic was holidays. So we first did some vocabulary about the topic. Uh, the grammar point was present perfect. So we practiced that a little bit. And then I launched the project, or as you see at the top right of my slide there, my entry event was a survey. It was a survey about holidays before COVID. And you'll see a few of the questions uh, my students asked. They did the survey in class, so they interviewed each other and then we tallied their results. Now, that was my launch event for this example case study project. But with other groups, as you see at the bottom there, I've sometimes used a photograph or a picture to, to get a discussion going, or maybe a, an audio recording, a short video clip, perhaps even a written text, just some activity to get students thinking about the topic and get them started on their project. So that's really a launch event. Anything that gets them thinking about the topic and then they can go off and start their project. Now, let me pause here for a moment. What is the first stage? So again, you can make a comment uh, in the chat if you like, or you can just think about it. What was that first stage in setting up a project? Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Babita. Okay, so we've got the answers. It's the launch event or the entry event, something to get them started, to get them thinking about it. Now, going back to uh, my holiday survey, after we finished the survey, we had a little class discussion. We established that we couldn't go on the same types of holidays now because of COVID restrictions. But if we were creative about it, we could still find some alternatives that um, we, we could do to, to have an enjoyable holiday. So that led us very nicely into the next stage, which is to set the research question. This is also called a driving question or an entry question. And you'll see on the board what um, the question I set for my group. How can we plan some COVID-friendly holiday experiences for Sri Lankan teenagers and their families. Now, with, with my group, they're quite a low-level group, and this was the first time they were doing a, a complex project like this. So I actually gave them the question, and that's one way of doing it. But if you have a higher-level group, or maybe students who are used to doing projects, you could give them the topic and ask them to come up with their own research question. If they're struggling, here's a tool that might help. So this picture you see on the screen, this is called a tube brick. It's got these little um, words there. The first is question words, and there's lots of them. Then you've got different subjects. You've got lots of main verbs, and it ends with some different types of audience, very specific audiences. So the idea is that they can move these tabs around and come up with their own research question. I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, and Paul, if you don't mind, if you can just share that first link in the chat. You don't need to open the link now, but maybe you can save it. This link will take you to a PDF that you can download and print out and use that to create one of these two bricks. That's what I did. And, and this is what it looks like. Thanks for the link, Paul. So you see the little orange tabs, and I'm not sure if you can see it moving around, but that's how students can create their questions. So maybe the first question can be, how can? And the subject might be, we. The verb might be, create. So maybe they think, how can we create 
um, say, a plastic-free environment. And then they need to narrow down the audience. So maybe because these are secondary students, we can do for a school. How can we create a plastic-free environment for our school? And that's their research question. So this is a really useful tool, the TubeRick, to help them come up with their own research questions. Now, again, if I pause there and ask you, can you remember the second stage? So the first stage was the launch event. What's the second stage? You can uh, type an answer in the chat or even just think about it. Great, I've got some answers coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Masa. So remember the tube brick? Thank you, Melina. Great. So the second stage is the research question where you set the question or you ask your students to come up with their own question. Now, once we've got our research question, the third stage is the KWL activity. Now, some of you may be familiar with this kind of chart. If you're not, Paul, if you can send uh, the second link in the chat box, please. Again, you don't need to uh, click on the link now. Perhaps you can save it for later. It'll, it'll take you to a chart like this. So just focusing on my slide now, the first K stands for no. So in group, students would brainstorm and write down what they know about the research question. The W in the middle stands for want. What do they want to know? What, what do they not know yet? And they'd write down questions, specific questions that they need to research in the middle here. The L, uh, that stands for learn. You can leave that till the end of the project where they can reflect back on what they learned and then complete that third column. So with my group, I did this KWL activity in class. I put them into groups um, because we were online, we were in breakout rooms. And together, they, they completed the K and the W. And as I went around monitoring and just checking, I realized that none of the groups knew what a staycation was. Because remember, our, our research question was about holidays. So of course, I didn't give them the answer. But that was one thing they wrote down in the want to know column. What is a staycation? How can we do it here in Sri Lanka? And so on. So let me pause there and ask you, what do you think the third stage in our process is? Again, you can send me a comment in the chat. Thank you, we've got one already. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks, Darlene. Lovely. So the third stage is this KWL activity. Now, once they've got particularly that middle column completed, um, just on a side note, perhaps you can start this off in class and then maybe let them continue at home so that individually they have time to really think about what they need to know. And then in the next lesson, once they've got the middle column completed, it takes us nicely to the next stage, which is research. So first in class, we came up with different ways of doing the research and how they could answer their questions. So the first one was obvious, go online, use Google and search for the answer. I gave them a few tips here on internet safety, on not plagiarizing, how to paraphrase, how to make good notes and, and things like that. Another idea here is to interview an expert. So because our project was about holidays, I encourage them to think of family, friends, relatives, neighbors, anybody in the hotel industry maybe a, a, um, someone that works in a hotel or a travel agent or a tour guide, because they would have first-hand uh, knowledge about COVID-friendly holidays. So students could interview an expert. Now, remember the research question also had an audience, Sri Lankan teenagers. So for that part of their research, I encourage them to do a survey, to survey their friends, uh, again, relatives, classmates, schoolmates, and they could create their own data for, for that part of the question. 
So this is really up to you, depending on your context. Uh, it could be to go to a library, to borrow some books, just give them options of how they can do their research. Again, let me, let me pause there and ask you, what was the fourth stage after the KWL activity? Thank you. We've got comments on, on research. Lovely. There you go. Now, a point worth noting is that this research stage should take some time. You should give them enough time for that. With my group, I think we took about three, possibly four weeks where they did this research at home. In the meantime, in class, I just carried on with their course with the rest of their syllabus. But in each lesson, I set aside just 20 to 30 minutes for them to come together in groups and just share their research, discuss it. And this really takes us to the next stage, evaluating the research. So as I said, in my class, they did this in groups. Some students had typed up their notes. So they screen shared because we were online and the others could read uh, what they had typed. Other students had made notes on their notebook. So they looked at their notes and shared, discussed uh, what they found out. Now, if your school allows it, um, there's some great online tools like Google Docs or Padlet, where students can type up the information they find. And at the same time, they can see what others, what their classmates have found. So, so this idea of getting together in groups and sharing and evaluating their research, that's really important because it helps students to assimilate, to really understand what they have learned. And that way at the end of the project, when they're presenting, they'll be able to speak and really express themselves in, in their own words. Also, this is a lovely opportunity for the collaboration that we mentioned earlier. So for example, as um, say another student is talking, students in the team can listen and think about anything that's unclear or illogical and then ask questions. Or maybe if they hear something new that they didn't discover in their research, they can add it, make a note of it. Also as a team, they can check their KWL chart and think about what questions they have answered now and what gaps still exist in their knowledge and then go off and research that. And that's why giving them that time is important because what I often found is after they did some research as they were talking about it, those uh, facts, that information generated new questions. And then that week they would go off and research those new questions. And so it created this cycle where they did the research, they discussed it and evaluated it, and then had to go off and, and do the research a little bit more. And keep that cycle going, or, or at least that's what I did. I, I let them do that until everyone in the group was, was confident that they knew this topic really well. So let me pause there again and ask you, what is the fifth stage? Thank you, Oksana. You've said evaluation. Great. And you're right. So it's that evaluation stage. Now, this is also a good time to start thinking about the final task. Like with my um, group, if you have a, a lower level group, or if it's the first time they're doing a project like this, I'd recommend setting the final task or deciding on it and telling them before they start their research. So as you see on the screen, uh, my task that I set was that I wanted them to create a vlog to give teenagers some tips on COVID friendly holidays. So because they knew the task as they were doing their research and then discussing it, evaluating it, they knew at the back of their minds that ultimately they needed to create a vlog. Now I'm just gonna pause and digress a little bit here. As I went around monitoring those research evaluation discussions, I realized that not everybody in my class actually knew what a vlog was. 
and they definitely didn't have the language to actually present the vlog themselves. So I realized that this was a gap in their knowledge and I would need to step in and fill this gap. So I planned a lesson where we actually discussed vlogs and, and I gave them a little support with this. So here are a few examples from that lesson. I, I did the vlog myself, just as an example, and we started with a few uh, listening activities. So we had a just listening, and as you see on the board, uh, a different activity where they had to listen for the specific details here. When I was confident that they understood uh, the content of my vlog, we moved on to the language. So behind the pink box here, I had lots of phrases that were useful in a vlog, and they had to match the phrase either with the beginning of the vlog, the middle, or the end. And then I did the vlog again, so they heard me. And this time they had to tick, what phrases did I use? And what did I not use? They had to circle that. So in this way, uh, please monitor those evaluation discussion, um, the, the groups discussing it. And if you notice any gaps, then you can uh, create a lesson to try and fill those gaps or address those needs. Now, so far, we've been talking about low level groups. And remember, I said we can set their final task before they start their research. But if you've got a higher level group or students that are comfortable doing projects like this, I've, I've done it in two ways. Um, I've let them start on their research and then I've asked them to suggest what final task they would like to do. So as I said, I've done that in two ways. One way is to let them work in groups and collaboratively decide on their group task. So they might say to me, Tashi, we want to do a presentation or we would like to write a blog about this. The second way to do it is where as a class, we come up with a list of suitable tasks and I put it up on the board. And then I let students individually pick the task they would like to do how they would like to present their findings. And that's great as well, because it gives them some autonomy over, over their work. So if I pause here again, and just let you think about what I've discussed, because there were one or two different points there. What would you say the sixth stage was? So after the research and evaluation. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Nadia. Thanks, Oksana. Yes, quite a few have said final task. That's right. So remember, there were a few extra points here that you could set the final task before the research if it's a low level, or with everybody else, you can set the final task at this point. And remember to decide whether they're going to do it alone or as a team. And if you notice any gaps in their knowledge, this is the time to plan a lesson and then address that gap. Because we've just been talking about final tasks, let me show you a few examples from um, some different groups and the project work they've done. And as you watch the videos or um, some photos I've taken of their work, just think, what is this task they're doing? So don't worry about the content, but what is the actual task? Is it where they've written a story? Is it where they're doing um, an interview? Is it a presentation? What is the actual task? Well, I'm going to stop screen sharing now. And if you can play the first video, please. Sorry, Tasha, I'm just going now. No problem. I had it, I just lost it. <laughs> I had it all set up and everything. Okay. It's video one. Yeah, no, I know. Um, uh, sorry, two, just two seconds. Okay. 
<sighs> all right, all set up and now it looks very professional, unprofessional, doesn't it? And the blue one, where have we gone? Oh, the blue one, okay. Here we go. Perhaps just check the sound, please, Paul. Can everyone hear that? Can you hear that okay? I can't. What about now? Okay. I'm sorry, Paul, I don't think they can hear the sound. Really? Yes, the chat box says nothing and no sound. Uh, okay, hang on, I'll stop sharing and try again. I'll definitely set it so that it's share sound. Just give us a moment and, and you'll hear it with the sound in just a few seconds. Okay, hopefully. <laughs> Welcome to Jay's Travel Blog. I'm your host Jay and today I'm going to tell you all about how you can have a COVID friendly holiday. So, how about having a party with friends? Oh, cut cut, it's not COVID friendly. Okay guys, let's jump into the video. First up, camping in backyard. When you can't go on a vacation, you can try this at home. Uh, you can do a barbecue, eat out, cook out, uh, spend the night under the stars. On the other hand, you can tell some horror stories and remember some horror movies you have ever watched. So I think it's a great experience. Uh, you can try it at home. We can pause that. Secondly, Thank you for why don't you try some? Okay. Okay, everyone. So have a think. What was that task? And please um, tell me in the chat. So what kind of final task do you think that was? We've got an idea, a video. Great. We've got lots of comments coming in saying uh, a blog, a travel blog, and that's exactly right. So this was the, the case study we've been talking about so far, and their task was to create a blog. Let me give you another example. Uh, this was actually a different topic about waste and reducing waste, and this was obviously a piece of writing. Don't read uh, the content, but just looking at the layout and the structure, what kind of writing do you think this is? What do you think the task is? We've got one idea, a website. Great, we've got quite a few saying a blog and that's exactly right. So the topic here was about school children reducing waste. And this one student decided to write a blog about it. Here's uh, another example. It's the same topic of waste. Again, don't look at the actual content, but just looking at the structure. What do you think this task is? Is this also a blog or is it a different kind of writing? Someone said an article, a leaflet. Great, and, and you're right. It was an article, um, specifically an article for a teen magazine. So you'll notice that's an example how, of, of the same topic, the same project, but two students picked two different uh, final tasks for it. We've got another video now, video two. Paul? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back to the SL Teen Show. So today we are going to be talking about upcycling. Yes, you heard me right. We are going to be talking about upcycling. So me and my teenage friends have arranged a lot of fun and interesting things to you guys. So please stay tuned until the end. 
So without further ado, let's get into it. What is upcycling? Simply, upcycling means taking something that is old or that something that is not in use anymore and creating a new craft or a new thing out of it that will be useful uh, or that you can use as a decoration a thing that will get work done like that creating something new out of all thing instead of throwing it away that is in my words what is upcycling so for an example it's let's say there, that Paul. you have so I was fine to right now <laughs> <laughs> sorry um so please tell me what do you think that second video was what was the task so a few people said a video presentation a how to do or a diy video great so this one was actually supposed to be a, a documentary style tv show so yes it was presenting um as if it was a tv show and Paul, if you could play the third video now. Mm -hmm. This again is a different topic. This was about a benefit concert. Um, this third video, the sound quality is rather poor, so don't worry about it. But just from what you see, what do you think the task was? And a second question for this one, how is the presentation a little different to the previous two videos? Thank you, Paul. Probably make sure because uh, they're international, they have branches all around the world, and also they know best on how to use this money. So, what do you do? So, thank you, Navidu. Uh, so, I'm gonna talk about the thing who, who are gonna attend for the concert. So, we'll be sending uh, emails, invites to uh, popular singers all around the world. And uh, if like if they want to perform, they, they will uh, send an email to us saying um, that they would like to perform and how many songs like you can. The highest limit is three songs because of the timing and scheduling. So we'll be scheduling the time slots for the singer. So over to you, City Judge. Thank you, Paul. So thank you for your comments. Um, it's interesting, quite a few people thought it was an interview, maybe because there were two people. So you picked up on the fact that there were two presenters and that really is what made it a, a little different. Just give me one moment to, there we go. So as I said, the, the background, the research question here was a benefit concert and they were pitching their ideas to a sponsor. So it was a presentation. As one person mentioned, they used PowerPoint. And here, what was special is that they did it as a team, as a group. So I'm sorry, it wasn't PowerPoint, it was actually Google Slides that they used. So their presentation was done collaboratively. Now, those were four ideas uh, that I gave you. Can you think of any more ideas for final tasks? You could perhaps tell me in the chat or just think about it. Great, a podcast. That's a lovely idea, Melina. A brochure, an infographic. Great, radio program. Lovely, thank you. And on the screen, I've got a few more for you. On the left, you've got uh, tasks for speaking. And on the right, writing tasks. Now, it's important that we think about assessment as well. And with a long project like this, there's so much you can assess. So first, if you have access to their research notes, you can assess that, and you'll see on the screen a few pointers of what to look out for. Second, you can assess their speaking. So remember those research evaluation discussions, the group work, you can monitor at that stage. Uh, and again, I've given you a few ideas of what you can look for with their speaking. And of course, uh, you can and should assess the final task. Now, it's important here with the final task that you set the assessment criteria before they actually start putting their task together. You could either give them the criteria yourself 
or ask them to suggest how they would like to be assessed and graded. Um, if you're using online tools, that's a lovely idea to make sure that it's collaborative. So if it's writing, you can use Google Docs or Padlet. And as you saw in that third video, if it's a speaking task like a presentation, Google Slides are useful. I, I often like to get uh, my students to do their final task and get some peer feedback. Um, a few tips if you're doing this, give them a bit of guidance about how to give peer feedback. So one important point is to use the same assessment criteria that you're going to use at the end. Um, remind them to be kind uh, and yet honest when they're giving feedback. Perhaps another point is to mention all the good things, to praise all the positive things, but specify one or two points that their friend or their classmate can work on or improve on. And that's an example, uh, the picture that you see is an example of that. So this was a piece of writing. Um, it was done online, so the student screen shared. And you'll see that their team members used the annotation tool to, to help, help them improve their accuracy in this case. Then they would take all that feedback, work on their final task a little bit more, and finally present it to you, and then you assess. And that's really the end of the project. So let's have a look at the different stages we went through. Um, we don't have time to go through this stage by stage. So perhaps look at your notes and in the chat, can you tell me the order? What order do you think the uh, stages should be in? Just A, B, C. Great, B is first, well done. What comes after B? Yes, F comes after B, well done. And what's after F? Yes, well done, it's I. What's after I? Great, I've got the D. And what's after the D? Lovely, I've got a couple of the H's. What's after the H? We've got a few different ones here. So after the H is the E, you set the assessment criteria. Now we're getting into the assessment part of it. The last three sort of follow one after the other. What would you say the last three were? Good, we've got A. Great, A, C, G. Lovely. So there you go. That's the correct order. And that's the framework I use. Um, and I'm sure you can use it as well. So that brings us to the end of uh, the webinar. But just think about how we began. Remember those bored teenagers that were not motivated, not interested? Well, here are a few comments from the same bored teenagers. But this is at the end of their first experience with project-based learning. Have a look at what they say. So see in the first comment, the words magnificent, fun, amazing. She doesn't sound bored anymore, does she? And in the second one, she says she learned not just English, uh, but facts, so information. And then she mentions all the skills that she practiced. Same with the third comment. He mentions skills and also core skills like using the internet, interpersonal relationships, and things like that. So I can assure you, uh, it does take a bit of time and it is a bit of extra effort on the teacher's part to set up a project like this, but, but the results, the rewards really make it worthwhile. The rewards come by way of far higher levels of student engagement. And as you can see with the comments here, students end up being so much more confident about these new skills they've acquired. So I really hope that you will try out at least some of the ideas we discussed today, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it as much as I have. Just very quickly now, if we just think about what we've done, um, and maybe just think about next year, is there anything you'd like to try out from anything you heard today? Is there anything you think might be difficult for you? 
perhaps you could think about it or, or send a brief comment in the chat. And maybe I'll stop there and let Paul come in. Great, thank you, Tash. That was brilliant. Thank you very so much for that. That's brilliant. I, uh, yes, I want to go and do a project now. I think so. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'll be doing. <laughs> um, just to say, there's a couple of people. Or someone's asked if we can have the transcript. We're not. We don't provide the transcript. We do provide the recording, and we're also um, recording on uh, or streaming this on Facebook um, and. The recording will be on YouTube, uh, and although there's not the transcript, you do have the the subtitles, so you will be able to see the uh, the subtitles um, if you want to watch the recording. Uh, I'll just put links in there for recordings and the certificate and the feedback survey. So please do click on those. And as I said, if you're watching on a mobile, you won't be able to um, click on those, but you will get an email tomorrow um, to say thank you for coming to the webinar. And um, that will have all of the links in. Um, so don't panic. Okay, question. Sorry. Um, oh, quick one. Vlog. What is, what's a vlog, Tash? Um, <laughs> if, you, if you Google it on YouTube, I promise you, you get thousands of vlogs. So basically, it's, it's um, a video so you're speaking and it can be about any topic under the sun so in the first video that you watched if you remember that young boy he was talking about tips uh for holidays covid friendly holidays so it can really be anything that you generally post on social media you post it online and it's you speaking about a topic that interests you um Okay, this is, this is from Gloria. Um, Gloria says, how do that you choose... That was interesting. Sorry, yeah, go, go for it. Um, how do you choose the research uh, question? Yes, question? thank you, Gloria. That was a great question. How do you choose the research question, the actual topic of the whole project? And she asked if I carried out a survey or did a needs analysis. Those are both great ideas to pick topics that students would be interested in. Uh, but in my case, Gloria, I was restrained because I, I had a module that I had to teach. The topic was given to me. So in your school, if you've got a course book to follow or if you've got a set syllabus, you might be constrained by that. So then the, the project topic would be whatever is in your syllabus, whatever is in your course book. However, um, using something like this, you could let your students narrow down the actual research question to make it valid for them, to make it suit uh, perhaps the local context or whatever uh, audience they want to address their project to. I hope that answers your question, Gloria. Uh, it does, it sort of answers my question as well, um, which was around the kind of obviously with the teachers where they've got the time constraints and they've got syllabus to cover and how, how you fit a project like that. that in but you've kind of answered that question so um so we're good with that one um where are we? okay um perhaps the one that raja asked about weak students mm -hmm. i think yeah. that's another uh worthwhile question because you, you do have maybe very weak students and then what they can produce is quite limited um now to be honest everything i showed you today i think the lowest level was a pre-intermediate level so you didn't see anything uh, done lower, beginner or elementary. What I would grade if it's a very weak uh, group is how you want them to do their research. So perhaps asking them to look online would not be a good idea because the information would be too much for an elementary or a beginner group. Instead, perhaps you could help them to come up with um, a set of interview questions or survey questions that's within their, their ability level and then ask them to go and survey their neighborhood or their school and collect data that way. So it's, it's how you get them to do their research that would need to be graded with a lower group. Yeah, thank you, Clash. Um, a couple of questions and sort of related to this one really um, from Angelina, whether you've got multi-level classes, um, so projects of students in multi-level classes, that's sort of the first part. And then there's also a question in the chat actually from Rua, I think, asking about where you've got large classes, where you've got maybe uh, 30, 40 plus students in the class. So I don't know, I don't know whether you want to take the multi-level 
question first or the large classes yes. first? <laughs> Let me do the multi-level first. So the, the case study that I did today about the whole COVID friendly um, holiday alternatives, that was very much a mixed ability class. So I had some very confident uh, students with a wide range of language. And I had some stu students who probably should have been in an elementary class, but they were in this pre class. So giving the students a, a choice of how they present the um, task at the end, that's one way of, of giving them some control. So maybe the more confident ones might choose to do a vlog or some kind of very complicated presentation. The ones that perhaps are not as confident might do something simpler, maybe an infographic with, with less text, more pictures. So in that way, you can cater to um, a group that has mixed abilities. The second guess, um, was about, hmm. sorry. No, no, I was, just gonna, I, was just, I was just gonna um, sort of follow up really with that, with the multi-level. I guess the, the beauty and, and the great thing about projects is that the students work to their ability and obviously as, as a, teacher um, it's kind of much easier to see perhaps when they're working on their projects the weaker students who need more support and being able to give them that support so it's you know I think it kind of, for me anyway it, it always sort of felt that the projects were, were a great way to really help and support the sort of the weaker students whilst letting the, the stronger ones kind of not get on with it but at least you know be able to perform to their their ability I think it projects are fantastic exactly. for multi-level classes so. exactly i think it is great because each one can do their best at whatever level that happens to be and perhaps you need to be more discerning um, in the assessment criteria you set if it's a class like that mm -hmm. okay and just very um, quickly about the large groups mm -hmm. um doing it individually is probably um too complicated it would take too much time so i would organize them into very fixed project groups a, a number that's manageable for you and get them to do their research and their final task, everything as a group. And I, I'm sure that would be more manageable. Okay. Um, okay, a couple of other questions. Uh, okay, it's interesting. Motivating students to do, to do online projects. Have you, have you had any issues around motivation with this? Perhaps. Um, I wouldn't say motivation, but if your students are not very tech savvy, that could be an obstacle. So I found that I just needed to help them um, if they were using online tools, just give them one to one support with using the online tools, navigating websites, how to use Google, how to search. So they needed that kind of technical help. but. I didn't really need to motivate them somehow. And this is why I loved projects. This is why I, it really was the solution to my motivation problem. Uh, because I found that just the nature of the whole thing just got them all, all interested. Another little tip is that even if they're a little reticent at the beginning, when you start those research evaluation groups and their friends start saying, oh, I found this really cool thing or, or whatever, that gets them motivated as well. They, they realize, oh, I, I, need to, I need to find something to share next week. Mm. And it, it kind of happens. I, I didn't really have to do much to motivate. Good, okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's kind of been my experience, I think, with projects as well. I mean, it's great that you've got that, that sort of framework and that structure in place. So they, you know, it, it, it kind of scaffolds the whole process for them so they can see, you know, where it's going, what, what stage they're at and everything. So it's, you know, they're kind of working to, to complete certain sort of tasks, if you like. Um, so maybe we've got time for one more question from, okay, from Morgan. Um, would you use this method regardless of your audience? So for example, if you're using it with native English speakers and non-natives, um, only teenagers or younger, older students, um, does, it, does, it, does your experience of this work? With, yeah. Yes, for sure. Um, Everything I showed you today, all the examples were with non-native um, speakers and some as low as pre-intermediate level. I definitely use it with adults as well. Um, and I have done project, um, a project-based approach with primaries. However, the depth I went into today, so this framework that I set up today, that was definitely with a secondary audience in mind. So remember sort of 12 to 18. That, that was the audience I was targeting in the way I set it up today. But the idea of a project-based approach is so wide. 
you can definitely use it with any age group. You just have to tailor the depth and the complexity to, to the ability of the child. Yeah. Thank you, Tash. Just to say, I know people were mentioning about some of the links, that that first link, that PBEL works, it doesn't seem to sort of take people to the Tubrick um, PDF. I'm it just so takes sorry them to, about to the, that. No, that's okay. I mean, I think if it takes them to the homepage of PBL Works. I imagine in there there's lots of... Okay, kind of... sorry. Yes. If you go to the resources, or I think there's a search bar on the homepage and you just type Tubrick, that'll take you to where all the, the templates are, the, the downloadable resources. Brilliant. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you, Terrence. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, a real pleasure to, um, to listen to and to watch. And, and I think also from the comments as well, um, lots of people have got a lot of useful advice and, and help with that. So hopefully everyone here will be uh, using projects with their students soon. If you do, please do let us know. Um, you can go to our Facebook page, um, whether we are recording this as well, and you can um, put in the, the comments there uh, later on if you've used projects and how they, how they worked. That would be great. Um, I'd love to know. <laughs> all right. So we've run out of time, um, unfortunately. Um, Tash, thanks ever so much for coming along. And, um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I've put links in um, to the recording, to the certificate, and to the feedback survey. As I said, if you're watching on a mobile device, you won't be able to click those links, but you will get an email tomorrow um, to say thank you for attending. And in that email, there will be all of the links that you need there. Um, so that's kind of pretty much it, I think, for me today and um, from Tash. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest Thanks, of your day. Bye.